For at least the last 100 years, one of the most important natural resources in terms of share of this natural resource industry in GDP has been petroleum. So the topic of this lecture is the history of oil prices. We have a chart here taken from uh, the internet of the price of oil from roughly 1950 until the actual day that I'm making this video here, uh, April 1st, 2020. This is graphed on a logarithmic scale and it's in constant dollars. The um, uh, the the, uh, the the base of the uh, the constant dollar is is today's date. So today the price of oil is around twenty dollars a barrel in current dollars. And what I wanted to discuss is the reason for at least some of the big jumps that we see in this graph. The first big jump we see is around here in the early 1970s. What happened here was that there was a war in the Middle East between Israel and its Arab neighbors called the Yom Kippur War. The Arab oil producers, who were among the largest uh, producers of oil in the world, were allied with the countries that were fighting against Israel. The United States was fighting, uh, oh, the United States was supporting Israel, wasn't fighting, but was supporting Israel. And the Arab oil exporters decided to impose an embargo of exports of oil to the U.S. and also to the Netherlands, which was also supporting Israel. So they stopped exporting oil to the U.S. and to the Netherlands, and this sharp decrease in supply caused the price to increase quite dramatically, as you see. There were uh, shortages of gasoline in the U.S. There was gasoline rationing. Some st in some states, for example, if your license plate ended in an odd number, you could only buy gasoline on days that were odd numbered dates, and similarly for even numbered. And it was a huge shock to the economy. As you, the gray lines here, like this one and this one, these gray lines indicate recessions. And you can see that this large increase in the price of oil, uh, well, you can see that it was coincident with the start of a recession. Actually, I would say that it caused the, the recession to start. So the whole decade of the 1970s after that was a decade of high oil prices, uh, in other words, around here. and increasing interest in energy efficiency. President Jimmy Carter, who was president in the last few years of this period, installed a, a solar water heating system on the roof of the White House. This wasn't uh, uh, photovoltaic. Instead, it was um, just used the sunlight to heat uh, water for the White House. Then in um, 19, I believe it was 1979, here, you had another very, very large increase in the price of oil, roughly from uh, $60 a barrel to 100, more than $120 a barrel, again in 2020 dollars. And this was because of another political development. Before this time, for about three decades, Iran had been governed by a pro-American government led by uh, a monarch, the Shah of Iran, who was actually installed in a pro-American coup sometime in the 1950s that was apparently aided by some elements of the U.S. government, for example, the CIA. Well, the Shah was overthrown in 1979 by an Islamic government, and the name of the country was changed to the Islamic Republic of Iran, which it, which is its current name as of today. And the disruptions in the oil market and anti-Americanism of the new Iranian government combined to generate 
this next big increase in the price of oil. And you can see that it is coincident with another uh, recessionary period here and another one over here. Again, the gray lines representing recessions in the U.S. The next dramatic part of the story of oil prices is a is a fall here. Oops, look at this this way, a fall in the price of oil. Uh, what happened here was that the I'll mark it again. The price of oil had been kept up in the early 1980s by supply restrictions. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, is a cartel of lots of the world's oil producers. It doesn't include the U.S., it doesn't include Russia, it doesn't include uh, Norway, which produces in the North Sea, but it does include lots of other oil producers. And during the early 1980s, OPEC was trying to keep the price of oil high. The only way to do that is to restrict supply. So the OPEC, which is a cartel, imposed supply restrictions, output restrictions on its members. But because the price of oil was quite high, lots of its members began to cheat. There's certainly an incentive to cheat if you're part of a cartel and the price is high, because if you cheat, then you can produce more and enjoy this very high price. In order to keep the price of oil high, the largest producer in the OPEC cartel, which was Saudi Arabia, decided to underproduce its quota. So as the early 1990s moved into the mid-1990s, the cheating members of OPEC started to produce more and more and more, cheating more and more and more on their quotas. The Saudi Arabian government, in order to keep the price of oil up, kept on underproducing more and more and more of its quota until in the mid-1980s, the Saudis decided they weren't going to do that anymore. And in a matter of about a week, the Saudis decided they were going to produce exactly what they were allowed, exactly their quota under the OPEC rules. So they weren't, gonna, um, they, they weren't going to produce any more than their quota. That is, they weren't going to cheat, but they weren't going to underproduce their quota anymore in order to accommodate the cheating members of OPEC. And as a result, in, in, a, in a matter of less than a month, here you had this large uh, decrease in the price of oil, from I don't know around seventy dollars a barrel to around here thirty dollars a barrel. This had very negative consequences on the parts of the U.S. that were oil producing regions, in particular Texas and to some extent Arizona and California. You might have heard of the savings and loan crisis. which happened at this time. Savings and loans were institutions a little bit like banks, but they were restricted to only making loans for home residential mortgages. That was the only thing that they could, the only kind of loan that they could make. And you know, the way banks make money is, is to make loans. In the early 1980s, though, the savings and loan industry lobbied the federal government to deregulate the industry. And the federal government decided to do that, and so it allowed savings and loans, who only had expertise in making residential mortgages, to make lots of other kinds of loans. And so in the early 1980s, particularly in, as I said, states like Texas, Arizona, the savings and loans got into the new business of making other kinds of loans besides residential mortgages including commercial mortgages, let's say, for shopping centers. When the price of oil collapsed in the mid-1980s, the economy of states like Texas went into a big recession. The, the, the U.S. as a whole didn't, so you don't see any gray 
uh, uh, bars there, any gray columns there, but uh, but Texas certainly did. And this caused lots of the commercial loans that the savings and loans had made to go bad, and quite a few of the savings and loans went bankrupt. I was living in College Station, Texas at the time. I was teaching at Texas A&M University, and I'll recall um, my bank went bankrupt and was taken over by another bank, which then went bankrupt and was taken over by another bank. All these bank transfers overseen by the Federal Reserve. The apartment complex in which I lived, the landlord went bankrupt and the apartment complex was bought by an out-of-state investment firm. So there were lots of economic dislocations caused by this large drop in the price of oil. The, the price of oil, as you see, fluctuated between the mid-1980s and around the year uh, 2000. I don't really have much to say about that era. Then between 2000 and 2008, um, you see around 2000 there was a recession, and certainly in 2008 there was the Great Recession, but between these, be between this gray bar and this gray bar, there was an economic expansion. You had an increased demand for oil, and this increased the price. Until shortly before the Great Recession hit, the price went to an unprecedentedly high level. This is when people started talking about peak oil because the idea is that oil was getting more and more scarce. And um, what we now know is that, to, to some extent, that, that's true, of course. An exhaustible resource is always getting more scarce than it was before because you're pulling stuff out of the ground. But the other thing that was really going on was this huge increase in demand. And once the Great Recession hit, the demand for oil collapsed, and then you had a large decrease way down to here. But that was fairly temporary, and the price of oil recovered up, up to here. Uh, the economy, though, was still rather depressed. You had another large decrease in the price of oil. I'm not sure what year that was, around 2012, perhaps, um, caused by the economy still having difficulties climbing out of the Great Recession. But the most dramatic change you see is the one that's just happened in the last month, which is a change in the price of oil from here to, as I said, around $20 a barrel. This is caused by the, the novel coronavirus, the, um, which causes the COVID-19 disease, and the concomitant shutdown of many uh, parts of the U.S. economy, causing a huge decrease in the demand for petroleum, not only in the U.S., but all over the world, where the disease is, is causing governments to ask people to stay at home and not work, and therefore causing huge decreases worldwide in the demand for petroleum. Besides the details, what's important to note is that the price of petroleum varies, can vary quite a bit, can vary very dramatically, even in short periods of time. And this is fairly typical for other natural resources. If you look at copper prices, nickel prices, aluminum prices, uh, prices for timber, um, you see large price changes which may not be as dramatic as the ones here for petroleum, but are still much more than the kind of price changes where we as retail consumers are used to seeing for the things that, let's say, we buy in typical grocery stores. Oh, uh, these are even much uh, less dramatic, I mean, much more dramatic changes than, than uh, real estate prices. Um, real estate prices, let's say, during the Great Recession, fell quite a bit, but you didn't have the kind of percentage changes that you have in the oil market.